Hi, I'm Sherry. Um, today I'm going to be talking about the French words of religion. Thank you so much for coming to watch my stream. Um, a little bit about me is that I'm currently a junior in high school um, and I practically self-studied AP Euro. So if you guys need help, just let me know. Um, hi, Sarah. So I'm going to get started with my stream. Um, so as always, so again, I'm going to be teaching the French words of religion today. Um, my name is Sherry. And make sure to follow Fiveable on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. I personally like our Instagram the best because it has really funny memes. So today I'm going to be talking about the French words of religion. And in the stream, I'm going to give you some background info on basically what caused it to happen. Um, what it technically is, who was involved, the major events that occurred, and what were the lasting effects on Europe were. So setting the scene, we have this beautiful picture here. Um, can you tell me, like, can you give me a guess on who you think this is in the chat? So I'll give you like a few seconds to guess. Okay, so this is not Francis the first actually, but before we find out who this person is, we're just gonna do a quick, a quick review on what you should probably know before the, which you, you should probably know some context about the French words of religion. So we're gonna talk about King Francis I. And King Francis I ruled from 1515 to 1547, which I put here. Um, personally, I don't think he's very important for the AP Euro test, but if you wanna remember his name and when he ruled, go for it. Um, so Francis I was King of France during 1515 to 1547. And if you know anything about the 1500s, then you know that the Reformation was occurring and Lutheran, Martin Luther was a pain in every monarch's and every Catholic country's butt. So basically Protestantism spread to France, right? And once Protestantism spread to France, a bunch of people converted and it left it and they started having a lot of religious, religious like conflict not not actual fighting, just they weren't unified anymore. So basically Francis I, although he was a Catholic himself, he decided to take the middle route and try to get a peace between the two, but he was harsher on pro um, Protestants and semi-persecuted them. So basically he's mostly important because he maintained absolutism in France, you know, divine right theory. Do you guys know what that is? Okay, so divine right theory was basically the king is the king because God put him there. Bowden? Um, no, divine right theory. So basically the king is the king because God put him there and no one can go against him because then you'd be going against God and that's a sin. Oh, originary theory? Well, I'm not very sure. Um, it's not... Personally, when I took the test, it wasn't very important to remember who origin who it created the theory. It's just important to know about the theory. So he was king and no one could go against him just in case. Um, and also Francis I installed a tail, which is a, well, I can't say it correctly, oops, but it's a direct tax on land and property. So basically the peasants who suffer the most, who suffer the most from this, they have they were taxed on their land and property. That's basically what we call what we remember Francis the First for. Then we have the Concordat of Bologna, which basically the Pope was granted the right to collect um, revenue from church offices in return for the king being able to nominate high officials in the French Church. So basically, that's a form of simony, which is like paying for your paying for your offices not very holy, 
which makes sense due to the Reformation trying to reform church offenses at that time. So it kind of plays in with the whole Catholic Church is corrupt. Um, and then we have the Protestant Reformation, obviously. So that comes along. And then the most Lutheranism didn't really spread past Germany. Um, instead, it was more so Calvinism that spread to places like England and France. So a lot of people, so a lot of people, mostly the nobility and middle class workers, they converted to Calvinism. Do you guys know what Calvinists are called in France? I'm pretty sure you guys have heard the term before. No, no one? Okay, so Calvinists are called Huguenots. So every time I mention Huguenots, just try to remember that I'm talking about Calvinists. So they're a type of Protestant. Um, and then Francis I dies and his son, Henry II, ends up taking over from him. So Henry II, second was he wasn't really trained to be a king in a sort of in a sense so he simply followed like like father like son that saying he basically followed followed his father's um his father's laws of persecuting huguenots because the royal family was the monarchy was catholic and you know when you're catholic and you pay for french offices you want to remain on the catholic church's good side so yeah. So now that we finished the quick refresher portion, do you guys have any questions? And can you tell me who this person is, this long bearded gentleman over here? Yeah, good job, Lucia. That is John Calvin. So just remember that he's partially going to be responsible for everything that goes down. All right, so next we have the French Wars. What are the French Wars of Religion? So, oh, sorry. Okay, so it took place from 1562 to 1598 in France. Obviously, we call them the French Wars for a reason, for French Wars of Religion for a reason. And here we have a map of France during this time period. So the green are Catholic lands. And here we can see that Paris, the capital is Catholic. And then here, all the purple lands, these are Huguenot lands. So Calvinists, you know, they are mostly predominant, they were mostly dominant in Southern and Western France. And then yellow's disputed land. So we're finally gonna get into what are the French Wars of Religion. So basically there are a series of wars fought between French Calvinists and French Catholics. So Huguenots and French Catholics. And there were eight civil wars, the total eight official civil wars. The total amount is still being debated, but there were eight official civil wars. And basically, they were fueled by dis a, a dispute between aristocratic houses. So bourbon versus guys. So the house of bourbon, if you guys are like ahead of me in your classes right now, you might know what happens to them in the future. But basically the house of bourbon was a Protestant house and they, had, they were semi-related to the monarchy. So basically they were in line to be heir if none of them they were in line to be an heir, a potential heir, if none of the royal family had a child, right? Um, so they're going to be the Protestant. They're going to be on the Protestant side in this war. They're going to be the Huguenots, okay? And then we help have the House of Guise. So the House of Guise was, you know, if Bourbons are the Protestants, then Guise is the Catholic side. And they sided with, and they were also related to the monarchy. Everyone's related to the monarchy here. So basically bourbon versus guys. One had one had Protestant influence and one had Catholic influence, but both were with, wa both wanted to take over the throne from the monarchy as people did back then because power is power. 
Um, so foreign powers got involved in this war. And when I say foreign powers, I mean the big foreign powers. We're talking about England and Spain. And if you guys remember from the age of exploration, those two were the largest, those two were the most powerful countries at that time. Um, so can we guess what sides they were on? What side was England on and what side was Spain on? No guesses, none? Okay, so basically England was on the side. Yeah, good job, Sarah. England was with the Protestants. And this is because if you remember that they go with the associate with the church of, with the Anglican church now, right? It's because of Henry VIII and his wives, his addiction to marrying more people, I guess. Um, so yeah, England was with the Protestants and Spain, you know, Philip II, we can basically tell that he was with the Catholics. So England supported the House of Bourbon and Spain supported the House of Guides. And this, the wars of religion are considered the second deadliest religious war in Europe. Can you guys guess what the first deadliest religious war is? The Crusades. Oh, close, close. Actually, the deadliest the deadliest war in Europe that was considered religious was the Thirty Years' War. So that's going to that previously, like the last stream, the stream that came before me, they just talked about that. So now we're gonna talk about who's involved in the French Wars of Religion. Do you have you guys have any guesses? Like the parties involved? because we know there's Huguenots and we know there's Catholics, but can I get like specific names maybe? No? <laughs> so Wingley actually close, actually not close set, Jed, but good guess. Um, you think you're getting Zwingli mixed with Calvin. So we have the Catholics, pretty obvious. And we've got Spain, you know, Spanish Armada, woo woo, you know, Spanish Inquisition, persecuted a bunch of not Catholics, that stuff. And then we have the Catholic League. I don't really consider them important, but they're just a good like name drop in your essays maybe. Um, House of Guys, which is the royal family I talked about that wants the throne all to themselves, and the Pope. Big surprise. You know, head of the Catholic Church, obviously. So this is the sigil of the House of Guys. Um, yeah, so that's the sigil of House of Guys. Super elaborate, super fancy. Next, we have Calvinists. So, you know, as I said before, they're known as Huguenots. And they were supported by England, Scotland, and the House of Navarre, which is a subgroup of the House of Bourbon. So, but this name, Navarre, super important. Try not to refer to them as the House of Bourbon unless you really forget it. And then this is the royal sigil of the House of Bourbon. And in the middle, do you guys know who this is? Can I get some guesses? Who's like an important woman in French history? Any guesses? And if you need a hint, then she is part of the monarchy, if that helps. Hmm. No guesses, no one? All right, so in case you guys don't know who this is, 
you know, fancy headband, fancy dress, nice portrait, all signs of a rich woman. So this is dun 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 Catherine Medici. And do you guys know where the last name comes from? The Medici name? Yes, no, maybe so. Do you guys know when it came from? Why why that name is important? Like, does it ring any bells for you guys, maybe? Okay. Yeah, good job, Sarah. All right, that's right. In the Renaissance, they controlled it. Florence, Italy. That's really good. So they're a banking family in Florence. And then because they're a banking family in Florence, they gain a lot of power because that's how it was back in the Renaissance due to their like enormous extravagant amounts of wealth. And Catherine was married off to France because they had so much power. So can I get some guesses on what side the monarchy was on? Do you think they supported Catholics or do you think they supported the Calvinists? Basically the Huguenots. Who do you think they supported? Catholics, nice. All right, that's good. That's really good. Yeah, they supported the Catholics. At first, you wouldn't be able to tell because Catherine, as queen regent, since she married into the family instead of being born into the family, um, she she had to advise her sons. But Henry II, as we just saw, he didn't really listen. So he followed after his father's footsteps. But Catherine stepped in and issued an edict of toleration to sort of release some of the tension that was building up as a result of Huguenot persecution. And this edict of toleration allowed them to basically live in societies by themselves, but they technically weren't allowed to pray together. It wasn't until a later event that they would very clearly side with the Catholics. So again, we have Catherine. And now I'm going to talk about the monarchy and their role in and their role in the French Wars religion. So the monarchy, they were moderates. And basically what that means was they weren't, they weren't completely for the Catholics and they weren't completely for the, um, the, for the Huguenots at first. You know, they just want to avoid bloodshed in France and to solve tensions. France already had England on their backs and, you know, trying to be the best power in the world while facing internal disunity does no benefits for you, does no favors, basically. So what we call, what we, um, so what we call putting aside your religion for something else, for the good of the country, we call that politiques. So these people were politiques, they placed their politics over their religion. And that politic over their religion really, it was a really um, popular idea back in the day, thanks to Otto von Bismarck. Well, Otto von Bismarck didn't exist back then, but he would adapt politics and turn into real politique, and that would make a very popular branch of politics. So politiques, basically, they included the advisors of the monarchy and the monarchy themselves, and they just wanted to see France be united. You don't want to fight internally as well as externally with England. So they went away. So they got. So they ignored their Catholicism and just focused on what was good for the country. So as I said before, this is the Queen Regent Catherine de Medici, Italian woman who married into the French royal family, and her children. We have Francis the Second, Charles the Fourth and Henry III. Now this is where everything took a really bad turn. Do you guys know what the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre is? And why Catherine de' Medici is so, is associated with it?
you guys said the answers earlier, so. Well, not earlier, but you got the side right. This is why she became associated with the Catholics. And we're gonna get into that really quickly. Ta-da. So in this picture, you guys see, you know, the bodies everywhere. Here are the soldiers. Here are some noble people. Do you guys know who this figure in black is? I think it's pretty obvious based off who we were just talking about, but can you tell me who the figure in black is, guys? No, no one? Yeah, that's right. All right, so that is Catherine. And this picture, if you couldn't tell already, it's obviously very biased and it was drawn by a Huguenot, it was painted by a Huguenot painter. And he says, and this is the Louvre, the building that they're out of, they're walking out of is, is the Louvre. Um, so Catherine's, you know, walking out, surveying the bodies, basically that, basically the Huguenots saw her as responsible because Catherine eventually did support the House of Guys who were Catholic, remember, they were Catholic when this occurred. And the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre is a Catholic victory in a sort of sense. Um, the Catholics basically attacked a bunch of Huguenots during, during a wedding, when they were attending a wedding. And so just an important reminder is that Huguenots consisted of the middle and nobility, like I said before. And Catholics, if we remember the French Revolution, nobles and those type of people, nobles in the upper class to the amount of Catholics. Yeah, I think Catholics win in size. So a lot, and I mean a lot of Huguenots died. It was one of the bloodiest days. No, a lot of, yeah, a lot of Huguenots died. It was one of the bloodiest days in French history. Very important for your essays. Um, so we're going to talk, these are what I consider the three major events of the French Wars of Religion. Obviously, we have St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, which I just talked about. And then we have the War of the Three Henrys. Now, this is what I, this is generally considered by historians to be the last and the last, but you know, the eighth, the eighth and last war in the French Wars of Religion. And then we have the Edict of Nantes. So basically, we're going to go into the War of the Three Henrys right now. So War of the Three Henrys. We have King Henry III of France, number one. Henry of Lorraine, Henry number two. And King Henry of Navarre. Can I get some bets on which one of them survived? Who won the War of the Three Henrys, basically? Do you guys know? Can I get some bets? Is it number one, King Henry number one, King Henry number two, or King Henry number three? You guys can just put a number like one, two, or three. Just let me know. One. Oh, any more? All right. So we have one, one vote for number one. Anyone else? So we have one, two, and three. Who do you guys think won other than Sarah? No other guesses? Okay. So Sarah. I'm so sorry to tell you, but that is, that Henry came in second place in this war. And by second place, I mean he died second in the war. So let's start with who you, so who you bet on. King Henry III of France. He was, as you can tell, the king of France. And he was supported by royalists in politics. So basically, since we know politics are members of the monarchy, 
and advisors to the monarchy, then we know that they're already a little bi biased. Royalist too. So he wasn't supported by a religious side, he was supported by the moderates. Sadly, he got assassinated by a crazy monk in 1589 which ended up making him second place in the war, in the War of Three Hundreds. Henry of Lorraine, Henry number two, he was supported by the Catholic League in Spain. So Henry of Lorraine originates from the House of Guise. I told you they were important. And the House of Guise, basically, they're the Catholic side, obviously. So it makes sense that they were supported by the Catholic League in Spain. Now, this Henry, he finished last. He was the first person to die because a estates general meeting, basically not an estates general, but a general meeting was called during the midst of this, this war, this the wars of religion. And Henry of Lorraine, Henry number two, was like, oh, I think I'll kill the king at this meeting. Little did he know that King Henry III was already like one step ahead. So King Henry III of France basically told Henry of Lorraine's guards to assassinate Henry, Henry in 1588, one year before Henry III would die. Unfortunate, but Henry of the House of Guise loses first. So then, finally, Henry number three, we have Navarre. And he, do you guys remember House of Navarre that I said earlier? They're a subgroup of the House of Bourbon, right? So he was supported by Huguenots in England because his house is the Protestant house. And basically, like I said before, King Henry of Navarre outlives the others and is announced as the heir to Henry III by Henry III. So when King Henry III was attacked by a crazed monk, he didn't automatically die. No, no, no. He had to suffer. And I'm not saying this to be cruel, but when he was stabbed, he was saved at first. But, and then they took him to go heal, to rest and like, you know, get medical treatment as best as they could do back then. But it didn't do much for them because it didn't do much for King Henry III because back then medicine isn't that great. So his wound basically festered and he became iller and iller and iller. And on his deathbed, King Henry of Navarre went up to him. So basically Henry of Lorraine and King Henry of Navarre are the only, are the only suitable heirs for the throne basically. And Henry of Lorraine got offed by his long removed, his very much removed cousin, King Henry III of France. So that leaves King Henry of Navarre as the only heir left. So on King Henry III's deathbed, King Henry III um, tells Henry of Navarre that he's going to name him the heir. And this is good and well, King Henry of Navarre accepts and, and yeah, he accepts basically becoming King Henry IV. However, there was one term, one little term of agreements. So on his deathbed, King Henry III basically grew up in the midst of the French Wars of Religion. And he saw how much religion had broken apart France. So to fix that, he asked King Henry of Navarre for one tiny favor that Henry didn't have to accept, by the way. Henry was like the only suitable heir, but he asked him for one tiny favor and King Henry basically agreed. So this little favor was that if you become king, if I name you my heir, will you please convert to Catholicism? You know, because the crown and the Catholics had such a tight, crown and the Catholic church had such a tight relationship and the people were mostly Catholic. Protestantism was just a tiny minority. Of course, tiny in population terms is a lot, but they were just a tiny minority of France because they were the upper class. So King Henry of Navarre 
being the good, kind-hearted person he is, says, okay, I'll convert to Catholicism upon being coronated. And that's exactly what he does. So here we have some pictures of the fallen Henry's rest in pieces. And here we have the victorious Henry of Navarre with his smug grin and everything. Here is the most iconic line from the French Wars of Religion that I feel like every AP Euro teacher will put on their presentation slides and now I'm doing it. So this is King Henry IV's coronation. As you can see, here's the, here's the Pope. Guess why we have a Pope there? And this is King Henry IV and all the nobles around him are watching. And this is King Henry IV when he was reigning, during his reign. He got his portrait done, stood nice and tall, but this is his coronation and the Pope is there. And what he said about being crowned was, Paris is worth a mass. And mass is what Catholics go to, hint, hint. So Paris is worth a mass. So basically, this quote says that all that fighting that they went for went through during the French Wars of Religion, it really wasn't worth it. Um, Henry IV basically saw how much it destroyed the nation internally. And he knew that if he remained Protestant, fighting would only just keep happening. Because, you know, now the crown's Protestant. Oh no, the nobles have more power because they're Protestant too. But yeah. And then the cat and the people, the peasants who are mostly Catholics, they would not be happy, very happy with that. So he converted to Catholicism to appease the masses. And that's when he said Paris is worth a mass. Paris is worth going to something that he's never done before, converting his religion. And it's basically worth being a Catholic for. It's worth going against your religion for, is what he's saying. And if you remember the word politique, this is such a good example of being a politique because he's placing his country over his religion. And King Henry IV was a really good king. He helped unify, he helped unify France. So now we're going to talk about the effects of the French Wars of Religion. We got a new monarch. Oh my gosh. Absolutism still existed, but they weren't as biased towards Roman religion anymore, and they didn't really care about. And the new monarch ended the House of Val Valois. I can never pronounce that correctly, but he, they ended the line of the House of Valois because all of Catherine de' Medici's children died. Very sad, but they all died. So the new house that replaced the House of Valois was the House of Bourbon. And decades of religious warfare left Henry of Navarre as the last successor to the throne. The only suitable successor and the last remaining successor. Religious tolerance. Never thought I'd see that in France. But basically, the Edict of Nantes. Up, oh, up, oh, Edict of Nantes comes up again. So Huguenots were finally given rights to practice their religion in a predominantly Catholic France. They could establish their own communities, you know, pray, worship. They weren't persecuted anymore. Jews, mm. but Huguenots, you know, allowed to worship, have their own communities. Catholics didn't bother them anymore. We're no longer persecuted, being Spain. Peace in France. So as I said, decades of warfare had ruined the country, right? And, you know, people grow up in this war. People grow up in this war, seeing all this fighting between Huguenots and Catholics. But the Edict of Nantes did a really great thing in that it caused the Huguenots and Catholics to cease fighting. And it led to an uneasy truce. Like the uneasy truce meant that while they may not be comfortable with each other, they definitely followed the law and respected one another's right to practice their own religion. Because, you know, no one wants their family member to die just because someone else practices a different religion. 
and we have the monarchy being strengthened. So the monarchy during the war was so, I wouldn't say useless, but they were pretty, pretty bad. Catherine de' Medici did her best to try to mend, mend relationships between the two religions at first. But over time, her patience waned and she snapped. And when I mean snap, she snapped. It, all, it basically culminated in the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre when she sided with the House of Guise and the Catholics. Over 12,000 Catholics, by the way, who had attacked all the Huguenots and basically killed them. And it was solved by King Henry IV. So King Henry the Fourth, yes, that is King Henry of Navarre. So when he's coronated, he takes up the mantle, King Henry the Fourth, because there were three more Henrys before him, and the wars had basically weakened the monarchy's authority. You know, Catherine de Medici, her sons weren't really trained. You know, one son died, another one had to take up the mantle. Catherine was queen regent. She basically controlled them in a sense. So she was doing all the work. And then King Henry IV came in with the wars, with the War of the Three Henrys. When the War of the Three Henrys occurred, by the way, King Catherine de' Medici died. Her son, King Henry III of France, took over and she died only a few months before her son did. So that ended, that that basically ended the family line right there. And King Henry IV, when he came into power, he did a lot to help the, he did a lot to help France. He reduced the tail, which if you remember, Francis I had set. And he basically made it easier to gain money within France. He helped improve the economy. He was a beloved France. He was a beloved king and reaffirmed the absolutism of the crown. All right, so thank you for watching. Do you guys have any questions? Do you have any questions about the French Wars of Religion? Maybe we can go over some um, past AP Euro prompts about the French Wars. Does that sound good? Let me know. Do you guys need any help particularly? Like, is there any questions you have about the French Wars that I can answer? Yes, no, maybe so. No question, guys. Okay. Well, oh, did Francis II die before French? Actually, no, that's a good question. I didn't really go over her sons, did I? Let me go back. Oh, let me go back real quick. I got the on Instagram. Okay, here. So we have the monarchy, right? And these are Catherine de' Medici's sons. She married Henry II. She was arranged to marry Henry II. And her sons went in the order of Francis II, Charles IV, Charles IX, and Henry III. And basically, Francis II did not die before the war started, French war started. He was actually alive and ruled during the second and third wars, I believe. And it was really, uh, it was really sad when he died, however, because while he was hard on the Huguenots, he was definitely reined in by his mother. And Francis II was always a sickly boy. So he died fairly young. Does that answer your question? He was definitely around for the first few wars, and but he wasn't around for St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, which took place in the fourth official war of religion. Is 
Any more questions? No, yes, maybe so. How about we go over a AP Euro? Topic on the French words of religion, sound good? Are there any questions about like what might be on the AP Euro test or something that I can do to help you? like prepare, because I know Euro has kind of a nasty reputation. Also, the time periods changed this year, so I'm not familiar with them because they got split into nine from four of them. So if you have any key points you want me to hit on or you can tell me like what they're looking for in this one, I can help you guys because I took the test last year and the test didn't change, just the time periods. Yes, no, maybe so. I know I didn't go over the the first six war. Um, I know I didn't go over all the wars, basically, but they're not really important. Like, what you'll learn them in class. Have you guys learned the French wars of, in, of religion in class already? Can I get a yes and no? Yes, no, I did learn this in class. I didn't learn this in class. Nothing. Okay. Well, you guys have any questions? No? Well, thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Um, make sure to come back next week for more streams. And yeah, that's it. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you have any questions, you can say them now before I end it. No? Okay, thank you guys so much for watching. Um, I hope you guys learned a lot or maybe you got some review in or something. Uh, thank you guys. Any Again, thank you guys and make sure you check into my next stream. Oh, Tiffany, do you have an, oh, okay. Well, make sure you guys check into my next stream. Uh, thank you.